Let's go! But this is a guy you gotta stop. Don't put... This is LSU football. Look at this. Boom. Boom. Finish him. Oh, yes. Those two plays and everything in the first half. We're breaking it down today. You guys enjoyed the Texas A&M one so much. I've gotten so many requests to do this one. Today, we're just going to focus on the key plays that happened in the first half of the game. And, of course, the number one question what about Devonta Smith? Why wasn't Derek Stingley Jr. on him? We're obviously going to discuss that. But there was actually a play where Sting was on Smith that angered me more than anything. So we're going to discuss that coverage. Also, that crazy John Emery Jr. touchdown run shouldn't have counted. LSU actually got a little bit lucky. They made a huge mistake on the play, and I'm going to show you how the lack of an adjustment cost them another John Emery Jr. long touchdown run. And of course, what is Kayshawn Butte doing dropping the ball? Now, there's no real explanation for him to pull a Deshaun Jackson there. But there was one hustle play this guy made that made me so freaking excited. And it's going to, it's going to excite you as well. I'm excited about these young LSU Tigers. We're going to look... At the negative, and obviously it was a lot of negative, but we're also going to look at it in a positive way. Let's go, Tigers. Let's do it. So, obviously, I don't know the play call, so correct me on anything that you think I get wrong during this film study. Give me your thoughts in the comment section. Let's get to it. Let's go, Tigers. Let's fix this. Let's go. All right, and here we go. I got to give Avery Atkins some credit. There's something to be said to have a guy kick it basically out of the back of the end zone every single time. So our first play, this right here is everything that makes Alabama Crimson Tide football so dominant. So let's go on ahead and blow this play up from behind the line of scrimmage. And the first thing I want you to notice, and I just want you to know, so many of you send me messages that LSU's offensive line recruiting has got to get better. Well, this Alabama offensive line, year in and year out, is just stacked with top five national players. Let's actually go look it up. Let's actually do the legwork. Alex Leatherwood, left tackle, number one offensive tackle in the country, top ten national player. Deontay Brown, number nine offensive guard. He would be the highest rated guard on LSU's offensive line on most offensive lines, but he's actually the lowest rated prospect on this offensive line. 113. On your other offensive tackle position, you have the number one offensive tackle in the country, Evan Neal in his class, and then Landon Dickerson, who is a transfer, the number four offensive tackle, and he's actually the center. So for those out there that say, well, LSU's got to recruit the offensive line better, well, you're right. And I'm going to show you on display why it matters. First thing, there's not many athletes that fire this low off the ball and they're as big as Alex Leatherwood. I want you to see this initial punch. Look at how low he is. And I know it's early in the game and they're fresh, so you're going to get your best reps from them. But I want you to notice this. Andre Anthony actually does a good job reacting to this, getting exploded off the football. A good initial punch, but you can see he rips under it. So what Andre Anthony is going to try and do is, some people call it a wrong arm, what he wants to do is, this is a counter trap, and what they're trying to do is run the football through this huge gap. As you can tell, Alabama's just eating LSU alive from across the way, a nasty double team here, uh, a good job keeping Ali away from it. As you can see here, Micah Baskerville is trying to read where this play is going. 73 is on a beeline to Micah Baskerville. So in this 4-3 or just basically any defense, Andre Anthony needs to try and get under this play. He's doing a great job keeping contained, which is his job. But now that you're out here, you want to try your best and get in here and explode this play. And notice... He does a good job after that initial punch getting right here. But notice this recovery speed here from Alex Leatherwood. When he tries to get under it, Leatherwood's able to reset 
And look at how far he pushes Andre and Anthony out of this play. Once again, Andre did a good job trying to fight his way back in. He's keeping contained. Boom. Out of the play. And notice just this little bit right here makes a world of difference. So you notice the rip technique right here by Andre Anthony. Great job. He's under the extended arm. But look at this reset. You see, he had no chance of getting a piece of 73. This allowed this play to not get blown up right here. 73 continues. He's able to complete his block right here on uh, Micah Baskerville. And this is just crazy. Every design run is set up like this where the running back is supposed to get through clean and make the safety miss, and this is just a really tough play for Todd Harris. Just look at this. This is just gross. Clyde did this all last year in this jersey number. So Najee Harris coming back, it's a little unfair because he would have been drafted in the NFL. Todd Harris, who's been playing better, does do a good job at least of getting beat to the inside. The spin move is nasty, but it does slow him down just a little bit. And he actually almost made the tackle. He's just an obscene athlete. Good job by Jacoby to chase it down. So let's keep it going. Play action here. And this was just a long night for Cordell Flott, who played well against Texas A&M. I like how hard he plays. He is from the state of Alabama. But this is just a filthy route. He falls down. Let's move along. So here we go. From, let's run this play from the start. This is just gross. Once again, it's Najee Harris being special. Let's, we don't get an end zone camera here, but let's just go on ahead and break this play down from the start. So what they're doing here, Alabama has brought in this pre-stamp motion. This used to not be a part of their offense. All offenses should employ pre-stamp motion because what it does is it stretches out your outside linebacker. So Billingsley, who was a tight end that killed LSU all game long, because of this pre-snap motion, he takes Jabril Cox out of this play. So what happens here? Well, this time Andre Anthony does get inside to hold up this B gap, but notice Najee Harris. A lot of running backs would just pound this in here, but he notices this defensive end has crashed all the way into this A gap, and this is where I'm going to show you where LSU struggles. Right off the snap, Leatherwood trust uh, Forrestal to get to the defensive end. And notice how quick Leatherwood, who we highlighted earlier, gets to the second level and seals this linebacker. LSU's offensive line has struggled with this. This is part of the problem of running a 4-3 because... It gives some defenders, if your guys are stacked head up over the offensive lineman, what that does um, is it makes it a little bit harder. Like the former LSU 3-4 defense, it makes it a little bit harder for offensive linemen to get to the second level if your defensive linemen are two gap players. Remember, this is Glenn Logan and Neil, Neil Farrell. They're used to playing in a 3-4. They're used to being two gap players, but notice when you don't play two gap defense it allows an athlete like Alex Leatherwood to get to the second level very easily and this is where this play is made once again this pre snap motion is going to take Jabril Cox this way the defensive end is going to get washed down but notice how quick Leatherwood is to get here and dominate DeMond Clark and he's had a rough year a lot of you know that Nick Saban obviously saw this on film and that's exactly what they do here and notice he gets through the second level. Look, he gets through clean, and watch him just eat him alive. Once Forstall gets out of there, they trust Najee Harris. Forstall knows to just wash this guy down. He knows Najee's going to bounce it. And Leatherwood, look at this. This is manhandling a human being. So guess what? You need Todd Harris to step up and race down here and make this tackle. But why doesn't Todd Harris race down here and make this tackle? Once again, this pre-snap motion. Todd Harris got confused by it as well. He was giving Jabril Cox a little bit of help. Maybe Todd Harris needs to race down here and fill this hole a little quicker. Texas A&M safeties do a good job of this. I, once again, I don't know the play calls. I don't know what you're taught. But, you know, you would hope Todd Harris could get here 
and and meet them right here. But notice LSU's defensive line gets washed down way too easily. Look at this. These are all your defensive linemen. That's not good. This is just really smart Alabama offensive line play. And year in and year out, all the way back to the Barrett Jones day, they are really, really good. Uh, when Barrett Jones is on the offensive line, they're really good at washing guys out of the play. And notice, because the defensive linemen were washed down so far out of the play, this essentially opens up two cutback lanes. A cutback, the play was initially to supposed to go through a gap right here, but because LSU's defensive line gets washed down so badly here, Najee hits this, and then look at this. Look at this finish. DeMond Clark is getting blown out all the way to Lafayette, Louisiana, and as you can tell, Todd Harris is trying his best. Neil Farrell, Leatherwood, just it, it, that's just gross. It's just filthy. And then a good finish here. Jabril Cox, not really a physical linebacker. Easy touchdown. This is what elite offensive lineman play can do for you. You can see it here from here. Notice, wash. Leatherwood just drilling, drilling him. And there's not a whole lot Clark can do about this. And this is where the argument for running a 3-4 comes into play. You know, if you're in these gaps like this, it's just a little bit easier for the left tackle to get to this next level. Once again, this is the key block right here. Just drilling. You just there's and I've been in this position. I was an undersized to fit the tackle. This and I know this is a linebacker. I've gotten drilled like this in the run game. It is not fun when you are taken for a ride like that. It's humiliating on film. So we haven't even gotten to the pass defense yet. And of course we're going to talk about the LSU's off LSU offense as well. Let's keep this train moving. So here we go. Third down and two. Obviously, we're doing the condensed version of this game. Good play to start things off. You had Kayshawn Booty out of the backfield. Easy pitch and catch first down. Let's keep this drive moving. Play action on first down. This has worked for LSU all season long. Hit your athlete in space, Eric Gilbert. Another first down. Hey, we're cooking with grease, baby. Let's go. I ate some lemon pepper chicken wings. I'm feeling good. Let's go. Let's go, Tigers. Let's go. Good throw again. Notice what happens when you... Let your five-star athlete run routes. Look at this route. Look at that. And catch after the hit. It's just freaking nature stuff. And you're going to see Eric Gilbert was probably LSU's best player on offense. Boom. Kayshawn Booty had an up-and-down game. And we'll get to, obviously, the play that all you guys are talking about. Um, This was... Interesting because early last week we were talking about you know the fourth and the fourth and one play where LSU wasn't able to get it. I want you to notice one player in particular we're going to highlight during this film study on offense. Uh, Jason Hines, he has struggled this year. This is where the play gets broken down here. Liam Chanahan, your center right here, actually had a good game. Chase and Hines just gives way too much ground here. Notice this defensive tackle is just blowing him into Ty Davis Price's run space. And, it, you know, it's one thing to get blown out and, and blown into the backfield. It's another thing when he turns you and actually makes a tackle. So, look, if you're going to get drilled, at the very least, twist him. So try your best to twist him this way so TDP could stay on his feet. And notice, because of this, because Jason Hines gets blown up the right guard for LSU, he loses his footing because of Jason Hines. And because he can't, at the very least, give just a little bit of push, this defensive tackle falling down is actually the one that makes the tackle. Now, LSU got a bad spot here. See, he wasn't down here. So you get a bad spot, right? I think LSU should have challenged this. They probably... They, uh, they, I don't know if you can win that challenge. Anyway, we go to fourth down and, 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 and one here. And normally Terrace Marshall's playing this role, believe it or not. And basically, 
when you run these tight formations, they, they just don't work anymore. Uh, they don't even work for Bama, and we're, we're going to show you why a little bit later. But, I mean, when you have these many athletes in here, you're just going to get blown out, especially against Texas A&M when this play didn't work. Just quarterback sneak it every time, and th- th- there's nothing really fancy about this. Deculus gets driven back, and even here, notice Torrey Carter does his job on this play, but Alabama knows what they're doing. All they, they, they know that this ball is going here or it's going to be a quarterback sneak. So even though Torrey Carter gets his block on the play, it still doesn't matter. Because he's so tight, he can just submarine in there. And it, it's, just a, it's just a bad play. And all offenses should quit this. It's too predictable. It's too tight. It's just too easy for defenses. Play action fake here. We start off and we're cooking again. Now... Brooks Cabrera, the advocate, did a great job uh, breaking down what really went wrong for LSU in the passing defense. A lot of it had to do with Devonta Smith. And, you know, we were complaining so much, hey, why is Cordell Flott uh, only in man coverage? Well, LSU gave Devonta Smith a lot of safety help early on. So Steve Car- Sarkeesian knew going into the game that the safeties were definitely going to help out on Devonta Smith while LSU plays man coverage underneath. Well, guess what? If he's in man and then your safety's right here, opens up all the space right here. They know it. And even then, I want you to notice a, a common theme. LSU's pass rushers know Mac Jones is not going to scramble. So when you know he's not going to scramble, you as a pass rusher have full freedom to cut inside, cut outside. You have a wide range of pass rushing moves. You're not facing Kellen Mond. You're not facing Bo Nix. Those guys can run. So contain isn't as important. But notice throughout this film study today, LSU's defensive line gets nowhere close to Mac Jones the entire game. Look, nowhere close. All day to throw. And honestly, uh, the the right throw here is actually Najee Harris uh, because he had no one on him. Uh, A blown assignment, but... You know, this is what happens if you're going to give safety help on one guy. What do you do? You overload that side with routes. So because this is here and because the safety is running with him, your check down is going to be open as well all day. He had two options here. Once again, when you don't get pass rush and the run game's working, everything's going to open up. So here's a pitch play right here. And notice... Alabama, it's just perfect blocking. Let's just run it again really quickly, okay? We already spent so much time. Once again, Leatherwood, watch this block here. Boom, Stingley doesn't want anything of that. And this is something that LSU did a better job of in this game. Alabama is so good at this. A lot of guys in this situation, whenever they don't see anyone in front of them, they just keep running, which is not the right thing to do. Because guys are going to be cutting in from this angle like this. You're going to notice Chase and Hines is going to make a mistake very similar to this one that Landon Dickerson doesn't make. Because he sees nobody and he sees that Devonta Smith gets a good block here on Demon Clark, notice what he does here. He actually slows down. Notice his head isn't even looking here and he feels this guy out. Now if he would have just kept sprinting, This would have allowed Micah Baskerville to come in and make this tackle. But notice he slows down. And because he slows down, he's able to get just a piece. And Baskerville would have made this tackle, and it would have just been a two-yard gain. This is high football IQ. He stops, and look, he gets his hand on Baskerville and then looks upfield to get somebody else, which he does. That's just incredible offensive line play. It really is. And Landon Dickerson deserves all the hype. I uh, His name slips on mine. I hope the legendary LSU coach here uh, who helped out for the national championship game is okay. Let's keep it moving. All right. So this is just a really well-designed play. You bring Mechie out, and then you throw Devonta Smith. Ali Gay actually does a good job here of keeping contained, but Devonta Smith is just too fast. So this is just a really hard thing. This is something that the Kansas City Chiefs do a lot of. They bring one guy in motion, and normally it's Tyreek Hill with the ball here. 
They trust Devonta Smith to beat Ali Gay on the angle. Ali Gay's had trouble keeping contain all year, but this actually isn't that bad because he actually saves a touchdown here. Good job by Jay Ward of fighting off, but look, Ali Gay kept hustling. Good play there by 11. That's just a good play call. Get a ball to a playmaker, make him make plays in space. So here we go here, Alabama in tight formation. I said it wasn't going to work. I was lying. It does work for them. But notice, it doesn't because LSU's right here, and they stuff them. And they have Jaqueline Roy and Jacoby and Guillory and Todd Harris. This is stuffed. So it didn't work, did it? Najee Harris, special player. And I always say this. The most important people on national championship teams are the guys that come back that could go to the NFL. And I've always noticed that with the LSU national championship teams. They had a lot of guys on the 2019 team that were good enough to go to the NFL, but they decided to come back. Whether that be uh, Grant Delpit, whether that be uh, Christian Fulton or, or, or Rashard Lawrence. They come back and they make the team better. Okay, so let's take a look at this play. Safety blitz, and it's coming late. So if a safety blitz is coming from this far, this is not the fault of the offensive line, okay? This is just a well-designed blitz, all right? So hopefully in this time that this safety is blitzing, somebody can get open. Here's a problem. Okay? It's third and eight. All right? And one thing that LSU has shown on film all this year is on third and eight, they don't run a lot of intermediary routes. What does that mean? They don't run a lot of slants. They don't run a lot of drags. They run a lot of routes behind the sticks. So if you're the Alabama defense and you don't have a Terrace Marshall Jr. to worry about, guess what? If you know that they're running these long developing routes, you can do what Texas A&M did, which bring safeties. So when safeties come and they're unblocked, this looks like it's Austin Deculus's fault. It's not. There's no way you can see this from this far. There's no way. You'll see the other angle. This is just a really good defensive call. Because if LSU's running all deep routes and they're bringing a safety blitz... You're just not going to have enough time to deliver the football. And you'll see it on this angle. Nobody's open. See, y'all are running deep routes. They're keeping everything underneath. This is just really good defense. And you're sacked. Good defense beats good offense. And we saw this all last week against Texas A&M. Third and seven, third and eight, true freshman quarterback, struggling offensive line. You can get sexy. You can get exotic on your blitzes. Just a really good call by Saban and Golding and that crew. We move along. Let's go, Tigers. It's still a 14-point game. 439 left to go. All right, let's see what happens here. We sniff out a screen. Well done. Well done, Jacoby. And they just sniff it out. The one play that LSU was able to stop. Okay, so let's keep it going. Once again, I don't know why even the great Alabama Crimson Tide does this, okay? Tight formation. So here we go. It's third and one. Once again, Alabama doing this tight formation. Look, they even blow everyone off the football. They get good push here, but because LSU knew that this was going to be a run, they know Mac Jones isn't keeping this ball and running to the outside. Because they know this, they're able to sell out and just get our boy, Najee Harris. But because Najee Harris is Najee Harris, Clyde was so good at this last year. Notice, LSU has him dead to rights for a two to three yard loss. But notice, Jacoby, arm tackle, he's still able to bring him down. But because Najee Harris is able to fight just for this little yard right here, Every yard in this matchup means something, okay? It makes it fourth and one instead of fourth and three. So you think they're going to do it again. They show you the same exact action. Nope. Slip it out. Good play calling. A lot easier to call that on fourth and one instead of fourth and three. Well, why is that? 
Because if you only have to get one yard, you're able to flatten this route out just a little bit more because you know you can get up field just for a yard with the big tight end. It's just really, really, really good football right here. So let's keep this thing moving. And this is just a well-designed play. Someone on Twitter, uh, I respect him a lot. His name is, I think, James Light pointed this out, that Alabama ran this exact play uh, I believe against Auburn. So what makes this play great is that Devonta Smith is going to take so much. Actually, it's not even Devonta Smith. It's Mechie. So Baskerville runs with Smith, and then three guys actually end up running with Mechie. This deep safety is running with Mechie, and... I don't know what happens here on this blown coverage. No one runs with Billingsley. It's just a good play call. Obviously, things should never be that open, but this is a Bo Pelini defense. So let's continue here. Good play call on second and one. Throw it on the outside. Let's move the chains. Good catch, Coy Moore. Let's keep the chains moving. It's third and nine. We're behind the chains. Finally, this play works. Okay, it worked against Vanderbilt. Didn't work against Texas A&M. And LSU decides to go back to it. But why does it work this time? Because Texas A&M was able to beat these blocks on the outside. And it took a true freshman for us to execute it, but it works. Coy Moore gets the key block here. And you got to get this block here, Dare Rosenthal. And he gets enough. Like I said last week against Texas A&M, it doesn't take much. All you have to do is just give a little touch right here and boom. We're cooking with grease, baby. Let's go. And he's short. If you're LSU, you want your track star to not get caught from behind here. It's just a good play. Good dive. And he's actually short. Flag on the field, roughing the passer. So it didn't matter he was short. Third and one. Quarterback sneak. Where was that on fourth and inches earlier? Quarterback sneak with TJ Finley every time. He's six foot six, two eighty. Well, he's not that heavy, but you get my point. Let's keep it going. Touchdown play here. Good design by Steve Ensminger. And like I said last week against Texas A&M, LSU's offensive line is not good enough. And with all due respects, their running backs aren't elite enough to run on first down against good defenses. They should throw on first down 70 to 80% of the time against Florida because guess what? They think you're running the football. Torrey Carter's in the game. So... They actually bring a corner blitz. And what happens? Well, when the corner blitz comes, the safety actually picks up the running back out of the flats instead of picking up our boy, Kayshawn Butte. This is just great awareness and good pass protection all around here by LSU. And notice the communications here as well. Even though it wasn't necessary here, I want you to notice Ed Ingram. Look, he's looking. He's looking for help. Liam Chanahan passes it off, picks up here. Ed Ingram would have gotten this corner blitz. And the safety plays Ty Davis Price instead of Kayshawn Booty. He notices it. And this is six all day long. So, a lot of you are going to make jokes about Kayshawn Booty here, as you should, him pulling a Deshaun Jackson, but he makes up for it for one of the best hustle plays of this season, okay? And I'm going to show it to you later. When a true freshman does what Kayshawn Booty does later, it gives me hope for the future. He should know better than that, and obviously, for those that don't know, John Trey Kirkland was the one that ended up picking it up. I never actually checked the official scorebook if John Trey was the one that was actually given the touchdown. I think he was. Let's keep it going. So, it's 21-7. to All right? Second and four. Let's keep this train moving. Missed tackles. So, notice, 55 actually misses his block. And this is really good stuff here from Baskerville. And for those that have been pointing out Micah Baskerville, notice how he slips this lead block here from 55 and makes this play. That's well done. That's well done, and he's frustrated. He knows he misses it. That's well done.
but they still get four yards in the first down. So, once again, LSU's pass rush, this is actually a good pass rush by Ollie Gay, but still really nowhere close. So, a lot of people have broken this play down, and you'll see it. They trusted Cordell Flott in the slot against Devonta Smith. Okay, before the game, LSU's defensive coordinator should not have done that. And as you can tell, this is a very simple route concept. Basically, this is what Arkansas did against LSU. This is what Auburn did against LSU. They just simply copied this, and LSU has not been able to stop it all year long. They know they're in man coverage. They know Cordell Flott is always going to be trailing the guy in man coverage. And because of that, what do they do? They run the defensive backs into each other. So notice on this route, they actually make eye contact. But this is not the guy who's even covering Devonta Smith, not even Stingley. So guess what? He had two different touchdown passes he could have thrown. He chose the right one. This would have been tackled by Todd Harris. But because of that, LSU has not made this adjustment all year long. They do, they, they, they've run. This has gone for three deep touchdowns from three different teams. Bottom line is before the game. And we're going to talk about the second deep Devonta Smith touchdown in just a moment. Um, you know, I, I just would have had Derek Stingley Jr. or Elias Ricks on Devonta Smith every play. And Brooks Cobain did a great job of breaking uh, this down. They tried to run peso coverage, which is a 4-3 where Jabril Cox runs as the nickel, and it, it none of it worked. None of it. And the reason why they tried to do that is because LSU had trouble with the run game. So they tried to run a 4-3 with Jabril Cox as the nickel, and you'll see how they manipulated it a little bit later. So now, this is my favorite drive to break down. Because I always ask you to not focus on the end result of the play. And what we're going to show you in just a moment on John Emery's long touchdown run is that LSU actually made a huge mistake on John Emery's long touchdown run, and they got a little lucky. So we'll break that out in just a moment. But first, let's actually discuss this once again at 2nd and 10. This play action and allowed TJ to read the defense has worked really well. Instead of first down and second down, I really like this look. Helps your pass rush. This is just really good. And TJ does a great job sitting in the pocket and... He gets knocked out, you draw the penalty, you get him out of the game. So, I want you to run this touchdown in full speed, Okay. And like you, whenever we're watching the game, we're not able to fully break down what happens. So I want to actually go to John Emery's stat sheet before we actually break this down. Because I got so many messages after the game. John Emery should get more touches. And trust me, before the season, I said John Emery should be the starter. So he had seven carries for 79 yards, but 54 of those came on this carry. So... He had six carries for 25 yards, which is four yards a carry. Not great, not too bad. So if you're going to send me a bunch of messages about that, what actually happened on his long touchdown run? So let's break down what actually happened. Okay, this is very much like the Florida game last year where Ty Davis Price had a 35-yard touchdown run. It was a very good touchdown run, but it was aided by Alabama not properly lining up. So right before the snap, LSU gets a really lucky break. One guy who was lined up over here runs to the completely opposite side of the formation at the snap, which essentially takes him out of the play. So because he's running this way, this makes everything a lot easier. So let's actually break it down. John Emery. Good job reading this block. Good block here by our boy Dare Rosenthal. Kicks out Allen, the defensive end. So now, take a look. Across the way, 
Ed Ingram knows all he has to do is seal this guy to the outside, and Ed Ingram has pay dirt. But notice what LSU gets away with here. Let's take a look at it from this angle. You got to look at all five guys, folks. Jason Hines. Notice he pulls in Alex Leatherwood here, folks. He gets to the second level, which is what he's supposed to do. He's aided by this defensive tackle stunning to the outside. So he gets a clean run, and all Jason Hines has to do is block your friend and mine, you high Baton Rouge native Dylan Moses. So all we need Jason Hines to do is keep this guy from running this way. But notice what happens. Boom. He misses him like he did against Texas A&M, and he gets away with the blatant hold. Now, why is that hold important? Because if Dylan Moses isn't held, he would have made this tackle. Now, why is that important? Well, we're going to show you in just a moment, okay? Because I always say this. Do you learn from your mistakes? Because someone in a booth needs to say, hey, uh, on that long run, Chase and Hines overran his guy. We got to get that block so we can get another long run like this one. So LSU, I don't like holding because holding happens on every play. I like holding to be let go more often than not. I'm a huge LSU fan. Trust me, Dylan Moses broke all of our hearts, but you and I both know that that is holding, and LSU got very lucky, and here's the shame about it. If it would have gotten called back for holding, everybody did their jobs. Liam Shanahan, Pancake. Austin Deculus wiped his guys out, and he's looking for someone else to block down the field. Look at Dare Rosenthal getting push, opening this hole. Look at Ed Ingram right here, getting a seal, getting two guys essentially. And notice our guy, Eric Gilbert. Look at this. I want you to see this, folks. This is called learning from your mistakes. Notice, he stops. Instead of just running, he stops and just seals this guy. LSU did not do this against Texas A&M. If you watch the film study, they didn't do it. Key block right here. But notice what I said earlier about Kayshawn Booty, okay? Everyone was making fun of Kayshawn Booty because he fumbled the ball. This is what I'm talking about. This gives me hope for the future. Finish. Look at this finish. Look at this hustle, okay? Look at that. That is what I'm talking about. Did not give up on the play. So, John Emery made a good cutback, but everything else is just gravy. It's perfectly blocked. He broke through this arm tackle. Look at that. Beautiful. So, you got lucky twice. You had someone misalign, run to the opposite side of the formation where you were going, and you got away with the hold, and you'll see it a little bit better here. Okay? Everything's looking good. Look at this block from Liam Shanahan. This is what I'm talking about. This is LSU football. Look at this. Boom. Boom. Finish him. That's what I'm talking about. Okay? Good cut by John Emery to see this backside hole open up. Boom. All right? Shanahan. But notice. All right? I want you to remember this. Remember this hold right here by Jason Hines. So this is a play that really drives us insane. Okay? And we talked about this in the live stream post game. Okay? It's first and 10. You got Elias Ricks on the field. You got Derek Stanley on the field. Going up against Slade Bolden and John Mechie. And oh, yeah, the greatest SEC wide receiver statistically of all time is Devonta Smith. Why? Now, we can have a debate about what actually happened. But if Cordell Flight got beaten on one play by the greatest SEC wide receiver statistically of all time, I know Derek Singley Jr. got toasted by him last year. Okay? They essentially do the same thing. Okay? These little rub routes. All right? There's just traffic. And LSU actually does a good job fighting through it. But look, what's funny is is this pass protection wasn't the best this time. We actually get 
a decent rush from Andre Anthony. But I want you to notice what Devonta Smith, Devonta Smith does here. And a lot of experienced wide receivers are good at this. And you can't really call offensive pass interference because it's hand fighting. But I want you to notice, look, he puts his hand against him and it just slows him down just a little bit. Notice there is legit zero separation here. Okay, but watch his hand. You see it? It's really quick. It looks as if he's just pumping his arm. But it's just creating separation. Justin Jefferson's really good at this. Just a little hand fighting. And because he pushes him off, he knows this ball's going to be thrown out there. And you're probably like, why isn't it offensive pass interference? Julio Jones, the great NFL wide receivers of all time, do this. So, why isn't Ricks on Smith? Why isn't Stingley on Smith? Why is there no safety help over the top? Folks, this is a 28-14 to game, all right? You cannot give up a touchdown at this point. You simply cannot give up a 21-point lead. A three-possession game is near insurmountable. Now, Derek Stingley did say at halftime he told Ed Orgeron to— he volunteered himself to put himself on Smith at all times. My question is, why wasn't that done before the game? And Gary Danielson brought it up in the broadcast. Well, Bo Pelini told him that he was going to try and put Cordell on him uh, or put Stingley on him as, as much as possible. So let's start from before the snap, okay? Let's see if there was any pre-snap motion, anything that could have confused LSU in this situation. Let's see. No. All we got to do is flip these two. Put Ricks on them. Slade Bolden, I can understand if this is Jalen Waddell and this is Ruggs and Jerry Judy's on the other side or whatever. But this is a guy you got to stop. Don't put your third best corner who's already been burned once. Horrible coaching. And this is on Ed Orgeron. This is on Corey Raymond. This is on Bill Bush. And I like Cordell Flott. And you can trust him all you want and you can like him and you can see it in practice. But you can't fall on your own sword. Horrible coaching, horrible management. Ricks should have been on Smith, especially if Derek Stingley Jr. has been hurt all year. It's it's simple coaching. It's simple. And I know Ed Orgeron went on a tirade on Bo Pelini. Part of that's on him. Part of that's on him as well. You're getting paid millions of dollars to outcoach the other guy, who, by the way, was out four of his assistants, this is just simple pitch and catch. Press man, three-star corner going up against, like I said, the greatest SEC statistical wide receiver of all time. And once again, there's nothing to it. So, we come back here. 35-14. to 14. You remember Eric Gilbert, who we just highlighted? Look at this. Ladies and gentlemen, this should excite you. Boom. Good finish by John Emery, but this is all Eric Gilbert, baby. Liam Shanahan had a great game, too. Look at this double team, but I want you to notice. Look who fills this, and he didn't do a good job at Texas A&M playing this role, okay? I think they asked Eric Gilbert to do this too much, but he really stepped up against Alabama. Jason Hines does a good job holding his block, but look at this stick. Okay, and he gets the blown up a little bit. Well, watch him reset. All he has to do, he knows all he has to do is seal this guy this way. Look at that. Beautiful. 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 That is excellent. Let's see it one more time. Boom. Boom. Finish. I love it. That's just great football. Shanahan finishing well freaking done. Second and 10. Let's keep it going, Tigers. We're down by 21. Let's go down fighting, baby. Boom. Torrey Carter. Now, why was Torrey Carter open? Well, you don't expect Torrey Carter to run this route. And he runs a good route. Perfectly thrown ball. Let's keep it moving. See it again. Linebacker passes him off. Torrey Carter has to just beat the safety on a corner route. 
beautiful. Just good football. Let's keep it going. All right. So let's go back to my friend and yours, Jason Hines. So remember John Emery's long touchdown run? It was to the left side. This run is actually going to be on the right side. All right. And LSU has to really like what they have. Kayshawn Booty, who for a freshman is a really good blocker as a receiver. You have one, two, three guys on this side of the football to be blocked by one, two, three guys. Because you're in this pistol look, you don't know if LSU decides to run the football which way they're going to go. Either way, you should really like your chances because you have an extra tight end here. So, for this play to work, we need one, two, three guys to block one, two, three guys. Let's run it at full speed. Okay? Ugh. What happened? How did that guy go through unblocked? And I want you to notice this. Even after the play's over, Allen's even trying to figure out what happened. Look, he's like, wait, how did I get through so easy? He's legit wondering, how did how did that happen? It was crazy, right? Third and 14. So what happened? Well, I don't mean to pick on him. And we talked about him in last week's film study. Chase and Hines happened. And this is why you need to be able to make adjustments. He whiffs this block. And I want you to see what happens if he actually makes this block happen. So what happens here is Liam Shanahan, who once again played a great game, his job right here is to get to this defensive tackle. This is the most important block of this play. So it's designed that Ed Ingram gets a cut block here and Liam Shanahan gets this guy going in this direction. All right? We succeed. Look at this. We're getting our cut block. We're getting this defensive tackle blocked. Boom. Look at this. We got what we want. All right? This is setting up just like the John Emery Jr. touchdown. Who misses his block? Basically doing the same thing that he did against Dylan Moses. He does a great job. If... If you want this guy to cut, you want him to go inside of you this way instead of this way. But what happens? You let him go inside too easy, and you don't even get a piece of him. All we need here, folks, I'm dead serious. Just watch. All we need is a collision. We need something. He just lets him go. He couldn't hold him like he did Dylan Moses. Boom. Now notice... Allen makes an open field tackle. Let's just say Chase and Hines has a collision. Look at what's wide open. This hole. Austin Deculus is killing his guy. Eric Gilbert killing his guy. Safety has to go outside for extra contain. Look. This would have been a touchdown. Or a 7-8. 9, 10, 12, whatever yard play. But when you don't make adjustments and when you don't see improvement at a critical block right here, at a critical position, everybody's a good athlete on Alabama. So everyone's got to make their block. How many missed assignments did you see from the Alabama offensive line? One, and they still got four yards on it. That right there, folks. It's 35-14. You've got to score a touchdown to stay in this game. This is a big play. This is a good play call. You. This is perfect execution. Just right there. Four-yard loss. Nothing John Emery could do about that. You've got to trust your right guard to get a piece. So now it's third and 14 instead of third and five, third and six, or a touchdown or whatever you think that play would have done. So what happens here? Fumble. Should have been a turnover. And you got a punt in plus territory. 
You notice those things happen. So what they tried to do here is they tried to do what's called a twist stunt where the defensive tackle goes outside and Jason Hines picks up this twisting defensive end. He lets him get inside a little too easy, but he does wash him upfield. Ball security, young man. Okay, does the right thing. He did better this week about stepping up in the pocket, but you'll see from this other angle, if you're going to do this, you got to run through this with two hands. Have two hands, run as hard as you could. If you ever watch Joe Burrow step up in a pocket like this, he has two hands on the football, can't do this. Can't do this. You got to reset and throw anyway with two hands. Ball gets knocked out. That's on TJ. Not the best protection, but you should have been able to step up and have that not happen. I don't know about you, the Cordell Flott deep touchdown I hated blaming Cordell Flott for it because he should have never been put in this position. But this right here equally makes no sense whatsoever. Okay? It's third down and five, and you're down by 21 points. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, we talk about this, right? Time and place. So... Alabama knows all they need to get is five yards. So the chances of them running a deep round in this situation is very slim. But even so, you need to be playing very aggressive across the way, which makes me wonder if Derek Stingley Jr. should have been closer here on Devonta Smith. Let's run the play at full speed, and we'll let you decide for yourself. Mm. Mm. And notice Sting wasn't even close. I don't know exactly what he was doing. He doesn't look healthy. It looks like he was limping. So if that's the case, why isn't Ricks on him? But either way, let's go back to the actual play, right? Once again, I don't know the defensive calls. I'm not going to pretend I'm the defensive coordinator or whatsoever. I'm just giving you my perspective. You've got to press right here. But Devonta Smith has already burned you for multiple touchdowns. Yeah, but that was those plays were on first and second down when it was still a one and two possession game. You're down three possessions, and you know if you can force an incompletion here, you're getting the football in good field position to score and make this a two-possession game. But notice how far off he is Devonta Smith here, and none of the other corners actually are. So, he's playing inside leverage, which is very normal when you're playing man coverage. Mac Jones knows simply pre-snap what's going to be open. No pass rush per usual, and Sting is nowhere close to him. Nowhere close. People. I I did a long film study, Derek Stingley Jr. versus Devonta Smith, where last year Devonta Smith tore Derek Stingley Jr. up. It wasn't really Derek Stingley Jr.'s fault this year because, of course, they put Cordell Flott on him, and Alabama did some good stuff mismatching and Brooks Cablana wrote about it and a, a lot of you have written about it but this rep right here you know it it makes you wonder what, what exactly is happening here we're nowhere close if he's not fully healthy which it just doesn't look like it it's either he's not fully healthy or I mean I, I don't know I, I, I'm, I'm very curious because this is just too easy you're giving the game away right here. And then you miss the tackle. It's one thing to get beat, but at least get close enough to make this tackle. I don't know if he was expecting the safety to be closer, if he was supposed to place very soft coverage, but it's third and five. You're down 21. I can understand that the game is 0-0 and you want to play soft and you don't want to give up any explosive touchdowns or whatever, but you got to be aggressive here. You, you, there is no margin for easy first downs in this situation. 
All I know is a lot of other great LSU corners would not have been afraid to get up here. Now, once again, I don't know. I don't know what the call is supposed to be. I'm not calling Derek G- Stingley Jr. scared. That's not what I'm saying. He's obviously not completely healthy. He's been hurt in almost every single game. But I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I, this look. Everyone else is playing really tight man coverage, except right here. Is this just a bracket? I don't know. But in this situation, it doesn't matter. You should be playing man coverage. You should be throwing some type of blitz to get this football out quickly to where this isn't such an easy completion. You're down 21. It's just too easy. And it, it just, I don't know. And like I said, during the Patrick Peterson film study, Patrick Peterson, when he guarded Julio Jones in those serious situations, as you can see here with this rep, we're nowhere close to Devonta. And it doesn't matter. We can't make a tackle anyway. We should have been tighter there. Who cares if he beat you deep there? You're already down 21. This is just good defense from LSU. Jabril Cox does a good good job reading it. Obviously, they still were able to get some yards. Let's just keep it moving. LSU forces a field goal here. Good defense. So you get a field goal, but you know, you're down 21. At least you give up a field goal. It's still a three-possession game. Alabama's field goal kicker actually is good this year. So we move along here. Third and five. I actually like this rep. (laughs) All Texas A&M game, but notice what they do here. Texas A&M, Alabama only brings four. They run a game. Jason Hines does a great job running upfield. Probably still a little too much pressure. I don't know if TJ uh, dropped back too far here. He might have. Yeah, he drifted a little bit. But notice what he does here. Steps up, this time two hands on the football. Gets through there. Finds his man. But it's just a little too late, and Eric almost makes the catch. So obviously, you know, when you feel this pressure and you see that man coverage, just step up. You know, he could have thrown John Trey there. A lot of pressure. But overall, a good rep. You don't take the sack, and more often than not, that's going to be a completion. Good catch there by Eric Dobert. Let's keep this beautiful bean footage running. Second and one. Once again, just the same thing Alabama's been doing. Watch the left guard just wash Glenn Logan out of the play. Actually, this is on Demon Clark. I'm going to show you why. So if the if you see the defensive tackle cutting like this, you should immediately be filling right here, but instead he's just guessing. He's just waiting. So because Glenn Logan blows this play up, your linebacker should be filling right here before uh, uh, before Najee Harris gets to here, but obviously that doesn't happen. I think that's what you're supposed to be doing. Linebackers are coached differently. I'm not Bo Pelini, but based on my reading of it, Clark drifts too much. And I know Glenn Logan's job initially was to hold this B gap, but he cuts in on the A gap. Once you see that as a linebacker, you've got to know if he keeps running, the defensive tackle is going to make the tackle. So a running back is just going to cut back into this backside gap. Uh, Yeah, I think that's on Clark. It's just too easy. Just too easy. That was actually well defended by the defensive line for LSU. You just got to fill. See right here? Fill right there. Too late. Let's keep it moving. 132 left. This is just good. The one time we get some good pass rush here. Good job by Andre Anthony making him step up. This is a good interior move, I think. That's Neil Fair. We get some good interior pass rush. Notice Mac Jones, two ends on the football, steps up. Waits for this route to open up. Good throw, good catch. Mohampton first game back. It's a rough game to be back. Obviously Alabama, and this is a crazy circus catch. It's third and ten. How many mistakes have you seen this Alabama offensive line make? None. Look at the stalemation across the way. 
which is why I'm a little shocked LSU didn't throw any type of blitzes. LSU's four-man pass rush had been pretty good this year, but you have to know against this front that's probably not going to be the case. Look at these extension. Look at these arms. Just eating these guys alive, and this is just ridiculous. Not bad coverage from Derek Stingley Jr. He thought that there was a push-off. They didn't. They hadn't been calling it all game. And we'll see the route here. Sting actually plays it well. Could he have kept his feet? And I don't know. That's a one-handed grab. You got to live with that. Better offense beats good defense any day of the week. You just got to let that one go. LSU's pass rush wasn't getting the job done. So that's what's going to happen. Here's something LSU's got to get a little better at. They're going to keep targeting Kayshawn Booty on these slants. Going into the game, and we talked about this in the pregame, how LSU probably goes to Kayshawn Boutte in this situation a little too much. Uh, into this game, they targeted Boutte on eight slants, only connected four times for 40 yards. All the other tight ends and wide receivers that have been targeted at least eight times on slants connect on at least six to seven times. So you have to know this. Someone has to have that charted. I read that stat by SEC StatCat on Twitter. But Eric Gilbert has been really good on slants this year. But who are you throwing the football to? Kayshawn Butte, who I like a lot. But notice slants he struggled with, he should have caught this. Was the ball thrown too hard? Maybe. He's a true freshman. He's learning. But what I would like to see happen, Eric Gilbert. Put Eric Gilbert in this position. Put Butte right here. Let Eric Gilbert in this frame. You're not losing much speed. Butte's faster than Gilbert, but Gilbert's as good, if not a better route runner, and a bigger target. A bigger target is more important in this situation not a bad route. Fight back to the football. Make this catch. How many times did you see Jamar make this play? Granted, that's Jamar Chase. He had a year learning under the wing of Justin Jefferson. But, you know, you just got to make this catch. And I know we weren't doing much with this drive, but there you go. So, we talked a lot about this film study. This was just the first half. I didn't, we don't have time to do the second half. We got to go to bed. There's things you got to do. So, yeah, this this was a lot of fun. I, I want to just do this play real quick. Okay? This was actually a blitz that worked against LSU last year. Did a full film study on this exact blitz. But you want to know why it didn't work against LSU? Because Joe Burrow was able to break this blitzer on one of the most incredible escapes I've ever seen a quarterback make. And I'll link the film study down below if you want to reminisce the Joe Burrow years. And uh, it's kind of crazy because the very next play, I did a whole film study on Ed Orgeron's bad decision to punt on the play after. And I know that's for you diehards that have already watched it. But if you haven't, I'll link both of those film studies uh, down below. So what... Alabama decides to do this play that didn't work last year, works this year. And notice the blitzer comes untouched because pre-snap, there's nothing you can really do about this blitzer because he hides it. It's by design. Alice, you can't see that this guy's blitzing. So he, he doesn't even come into the line of scrimmage. So there's a few things you could do about it. Let's go ahead and run it at full speed. He touches uh, T.J. Finley on touch for uh, basically a sack. So why did this work? Well, number one, you, you just can't see it. It's just a perfect design. So obviously it's second and seven. So... One thing I would like to do, since LSU so far this year has struggled picking up on blitzes, what I would do here if I'm John Emery and I see a guy blitzing and he's untouched, a lot of running backs just get a little piece 
of this blitzer. But that's an adjustment that Kev Falk and, and the LSU coaching staff would need to make. Because that's tough because you can't see this guy coming. But my point is just hit him. Just hit him right here. Slow him down. Because you can ask any quarterback, you can ask any offense, an untouched blitzer is a death sentence for every play especially these long developing routes okay untouched blitzer and what a lot of quarterbacks would say is if you know Eric Gilbert is man to man on this linebacker right here that should have been your first read I don't know why he went off of it so even with this untouched blitzer notice he was looking in this direction so you got to see this pre-snap Eric Gilbert on a linebacker. This is why he recruited him here. This football needs to be going here pre-snap. It's easy to see pre-snap. Throw this. But instead, he's looking for John Emery on this secondary round. He tries to go to a second read because he's thinking John Emery's going to be man-to-man on a linebacker. But notice, he would have had Emery on this angle route. And he would have kept running. So, what are some things LSU can do for this play to work next time? Number one, anytime you see Eric Gilbert on a linebacker, throw it. Unless the design of this play is to actually look this way and then wait for John uh, John Henry to clear out. But because this is a perfect play call, untouched blitzer coming from your blind side, you have no chance. So, if he would have had more time to throw this football, guess what? It would have been another long play to John Emery. But there's nothing the offensive line could do about it. So what do you do? Well, once again, you chip him. Running back, just chip this guy. Clyde did this a few times last year. Just give him a little shoulder right here to slow him down. Now, obviously, that ruins the timing of your route. This is actually a well-designed play. Just right into the face of a perfectly designed blitz. So just chip him right there. But anyway, that's not here nor there. I want to thank you guys for watching. Obviously, uh, for those that watched the live stream, I was critical of Ed Orgeron. But ultimately, what makes championship teams are returning starters. And you notice the players that really killed LSU, the players that were head and shoulders above everyone else, were two guys. Devonta Smith, returning starter, and Najee Harris, returning starter. Now, Leatherwood as well, but still, when you return starters, it means everything. And of course, LSU lost all these returning starters. And I get this message all the time. Well, come on. I mean, what are you expecting? What are you expecting? Yeah, you lost all this talent. Well, even when you lose all this talent, you shouldn't be losing to Mississippi State. You shouldn't be losing to Missouri. But like we pointed out against Texas A&M on a game and play-by-play basis, but from game to game, LSU really struggles with the game-to-game adjustments. And... It's just a problem. It's just a problem. And a lot of that is coaching. So one thing we, we've we noticed is obviously losing Joe Brady and Dave Aranda is a, a big deal. Last year, we talk about LSU's defense having a down year. Well, last year, they gave up under six yards per play. This LSU defense is giving up over seven. And there's only been a handful of defenses that have given up seven yards per play since, I believe, 2009. And LSU's one of those defenses. And that's a problem. So, you know, whether it be Cordell Flott or telling Chase and Hines to not miss that block, it's those little things. Also, we saw the difference recruiting five-star offensive linemen actually do. Got to give Liam Shanahan and Ed Ingram a lot of credit. They played better. But the unit overall lacks the ability of Alabama's offensive line. And I get it. 
You can't recruit better than what Bam has done on the offensive line. Totally get it. But you've got to recruit that position better. And you got to get better in the trenches on the defensive line and the offensive line. And even Ed Orgeron admitted that a few years ago when LSU lost this game 29-0. to So unless you have Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson, it's going to be hard to ever beat these guys again. And guess what? They're going to be losing a lot of guys to the NFL next year. So you're going to be in an even better position to compete against these guys. But to beat these guys, you've got to get better in the trenches. you got to make tackles when you actually defend a play well, such as this. Swim move right here by Ali Gay. We need you to make this tackle. We need this tackle to be made. You get stiff arm to the ground. And it's tough. It's a tough tackle to make. So, yeah, it sounds like I'm critical. I'm not. I'm, I'm telling you how I actually saw the game. Ali Gay obviously stepped up and makes that tackle there. So let me know what you think in the comment section. What do you, what do you think about uh, the, the film studies? What did you think about the game? Obviously, we're going to have uh, more content throughout this week. Hit the subscribe button, and we shall talk to you. Da, da, da. We shall talk to you soon. Our best live stream ever? Are you kidding me? Four hours? It's power. Hour. LSU. Bomb. Ba-da-bomb. Whew.